To pursue Lü Bu is to welcome death. Fabled as the strongest of his name, Lü was a notorious warlord who thrived during the Three Kingdoms period of ancient China. He is the warrior whose might no one could match, the lover who slew his master, the general who often betrayed his allies, the brute who served himself, and in death, the legend who became a gaming icon. Life of Lü Bu. He is most famous for his starring role in the video game series Dynasty Warriors, and more recently in Total War: Three Kingdoms. Lü is the toughest there is, but all that might comes with an ego to match. Legend has it he was an almost invulnerable warrior who switched sides on a whim, but history tells a different story. Chapter One: The Early Days. Poetry by the 8th century writer Li He describes Lü Bu as a green-eyed general, as well as the hero of our time and the will of heaven. But Li wrote of the warrior centuries after his death. Lü lived 2,000 years ago during the second century. He came from Jingyuan, which is the present-day city of Baotou in Inner Mongolia, China. He was said to be a master archer and horseman. Legend has it that his mare was a powerful Chitouma, a red hare, with the ability to leap over moats and travel over 300 miles per day. As a young man, Lü Bu was impressive, so much so that the minor warlord Ding Yuan recruited Lü Bu and kept him close as a trusted aide. But that was a grave mistake. Chapter Two: Meeting Dong Zhuo. In the year 189, the emperor passed, and a power struggle broke out between the different groups of the imperial court in the old Chinese capital of Luoyang. Ding Yuan, accompanied by Lü Bu, brought his army to the city on a mission to assist General He Jing in eliminating the influential eunuch faction of the imperial court. But He wound up being killed by the eunuch after the veteran warlord Dong Zhuo used his army to occupy Luoyang. Dong wanted to kill Ding and take control of his troops. To accomplish this, he persuaded Lü Bu to betray Ding and join him. Lü decapitated Ding and presented his head to Dong Zhuo as tribute. Dong was impressed. He appointed Lü Bu as cavalry commandant and felt great affection and trust for the man, and made him his foster son. Chapter Three, like father, like son. Once in control of Luoyang, Dong Zhuo put a child on the throne, a puppet emperor named Xian. Concern at this sparked others to form a coalition against him and his cohorts. And in the year 190, the warlord Yuan Shao led the alliance against Dong Zhuo into battle. Lü Bu fought many battles against Yuan's forces to defend Dong Zhuo and keep his master safe. But Dong was a despot and a rude and ignorant one to boot. He was also a coward. Dong was paranoid of assassination and kept Liu close by as his personal bodyguard. And like Liu Bu, he had a very short fuse. One day he became so angry that he threw a blade at his foster son. Liu dodged this and Dong calmed down, but the damage was done and Liu now held a grudge. The warrior became increasingly unhappy in his role as Dong's personal protector and, in the Three Kingdoms story, began a love affair with one of his master's maidens. Her name was Diao Chan. Lü worried how Dong would react to this, so he kept their relationship secret. While Diao Chan is not real, she is forever connected to Lü Bu because of the Three Kingdom story. This ancient beauty was sent by her foster father to turn Dong Zhuo and Lü Bu against each other. She was given to Dong as a concubine, but was also betrothed to Lü Bu. This led to a love triangle of hate, jealousy, and betrayal. One night, Lü slipped into Dong's quarters to see Diao Chan. She acts distraught and feigns a suicide attempt. She tells Lü she's ashamed of herself after being violated by their master. Lü is mad, and this is what leads him to killing Dong in the story. Depending on the lore, Diao Chan's story differs. Some claim she was killed by Dong Zhuo loyalists. Others say she roamed the land with Lü Bu. In one story, Diao Chan is captured at the Battle of Xia Pi, and Cao Cao presents her as a gift to Guan Yu in the hope of winning the War God's loyalty. But Guan Yu suspects trickery from Diao Chan due to her previous treachery and kills her. 
In another tale, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei all want to marry Diao Chan. They get into a heated argument, and Guan Yu then kills her to put an end to it. But now let's get back to the history. Later, some of Dong's officials pitched Liu Bu a plan to eliminate their master. Liu hesitated. Despite his distaste for the man, Dong was his adoptive father. Nonetheless, he was persuaded that Dong was not his blood and cared little for him. So, Liu Bu saw to the matter personally. Chapter Four: The Death of Dong Zuo. One morning, Liu greeted his master at the palace gates with a band of men led by Li Su. All appeared normal until Li stabbed Dong. The despot cried out for Liu to save him, but his foster son delivered the killing blow. And so, an order was made that anyone who tried to move the remains of Dong Zhuo did so on bane of death. The corpse remained outside with a burning wick placed on Dong's fat belly. The flame shone like the sun and lasted for days. But even though Dong was dead, his influence remained. Some of his followers banded together and attacked Liu's forces at Chang'an after they were refused amnesty. That's when their general and Dong Zhuo loyalist Guo Si came across Liu Bu. The two fought in a one-on-one -on -one duel, but Guo was quickly defeated and injured. His men pushed Liu Bu back and saved their master. The hot-headed warrior could not beat them all, so he abandoned Chang'an and fled. He tied Dong Zhuo's head to the saddle of his red mare and rode with his men to join the warlord Yuan Su. What happened next isn't clear. Either Yuan welcomed Liu into his ranks, then Liu acted arrogantly and felt underappreciated, or Liu expected to be welcomed into Yuan's army for killing Dong Zhuo, but Yuan despised him for his treachery. Either way, Liu was soon wandering the land again, seeking a place to carve out for his own. Chapter Five: Daggers in the Dark. Liu Bu next traveled to see Yuan Shao, the former leader of the alliance against Dong Zhuo. Liu impressed, but his arrogance took center stage. He believed he had done his new host a favor by eliminating Dong Zhuo, and Yuan didn't like this one bit. So rather than kill him outright, he played pretend and recommended Liu work for him. But Liu sensed something was afoot and journeyed back to Luoyang. Yuan had thirty of his best men escort Liu along the way. And one night, while at rest, one of them snuck into Liu's tent and stabbed the man sleeping with a knife. Except Liu wasn't there and never was. He left the night before and had one of his men take his place. And with that, the warrior with no place to call his own set out on a path once again. Chapter Six: Little Brother Liu. After a time, Liu wound up joining with Liu Bei in Shu Province. This was a warlord and man he held deep respect and admiration for. He even went as far as to call him little brother. Yuan Shu soon found out that Liu Bu was in Shu and wrote him a letter. He persuaded him to dispatch Liu's forces. Liu agreed and went to face them in Xiapi City. Liu squashed Liu's forces and captured his family and the families of his allies. Liu, meanwhile, was far away fighting a losing battle against Yuan Shu. He escaped and later surrendered to Liu. Yuan Shu promised Liu Bu supplies for his actions, but they never arrived. Liu was irate, so instead of taking Liu Bei prisoner, he welcomed him and had him work for him. Liu made himself governor of Shu Province. Liu would later leave and work for Cao Cao. It is said that Liu would even use his might to resolve disputes. Legend has it he once prevented a battle between Liu Bei and Yuan Shu forces with a single arrow. Liu proposed that if he hit the lower part of a bladed weapon, then both sides must withdraw. If he missed, they could fight. Liu hit his mark, and bloodshed was avoided. Chapter Seven: How the Mighty Fall. Yuan declared himself emperor, and despite their history, this was treason, and war would come. He sought Liu Bu as his ally, so he proposed his son marry Liu's daughter. Liu agreed, then disagreed after recalling how Yuan refused to help him in the past. The two, however, soon agreed an uneasy alliance. Once again, Liu was facing Liu Bei's forces, but this time they were bolstered by reinforcements from Cao Cao. Liu's men won the day, but they had angered Cao Cao, and the hero of chaos would see to Liu Bu's downfall personally. Yuan Shu was reluctant to send reinforcements. 
Liu thought this because he didn't give over his daughter for marriage. He rode out with her in an attempt to break the siege, but he couldn't make it past Cao Cao's men. The siege lasted almost three months in all, and Yuan Shu reinforcements never showed. And despite his weary forcism, Cao Cao soon found Liu Bu's men committing betrayal against their master and delivering him the warlord's key personnel. Not long after, Liu Bu too soon found himself surrounded and captured. It is said he asked his own men to behead him, but they refused. Liu Bu was bonded and brought before Cao Cao. He complained that the rope was too tight. Cao Cao told him tigers required tight restraints. Liu sought forgiveness and offered to help Cao Cao. The warlord considered Liu's pledge of service, but Liu Bei reminded him of what Liu had done with his previous masters. And so, Liu Bu and his allies were executed by hanging. Their corpses were decapitated and heads sent to the capital of Shu. And with that, the life of Liu Bu was over. I'd rather do wrong to the world than allow the world to do wrong to me. Those are the words of Cao Cao, one of ancient China's most spectacular and ruthless military leaders. He was the official who became a warlord, the chancellor who became the power behind the throne, and in death, the legend who became emperor. His life goal was a stable China, a place where everyone could prosper, and he'd do anything and kill anyone to achieve that. Life of Cao Cao. Cao Cao rose to infamy during the Three Kingdoms era of ancient China, a period which began early in the second century. He was so notorious, in fact, that Chinese people developed a saying using his name. It goes, "Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Dao." Translated, that means "Speak of Cao Cao, and Cao Cao arrives." That's eerily similar to the old English saying, "Speak of the devil, and he doth appear." But before we go any further, mythstorians, we're going to give you a small Chinese lesson regarding this man's name. Many folks pronounce it Cao Cao, but since when was this ancient Chinese warlord double dairy? If you say Cao Cao, then you're saying it wrong. Now the actual way to say this is Cao Cao, Cao Cao, Cao Cao. Got it? Good. What follows is not an exact account of Cao Cao's life. It's more of a combination of the history and Three Kingdoms lore. This is because Cao Cao is as much a historical figure as he is a mythical one. We'll try to indicate which is which. So, without further ado, let's get to it. Chapter One: From Boy to Man. One day in the year 155, a child was born. His name was Cao Cao. As he grew, so did his talent for deceit. Legend has it that he and the young Yuan Shao enjoyed hunting in the woods together. His uncle took concern to this and complained to Cao Cao's father, Cao Song. He said the boys were spending too much time together. This scorned the young Cao Cao. And one day, while he was with his uncle, Cao Cao feigned a bad turn. None the wiser, his uncle rushed to tell Cao Song, who ran to his son's aid. To Cao Song's surprise, Cao Cao was fine. The boy told his father that nothing was wrong and that his uncle had lied. Cao Song believed this and never trusted his brother again. As the boy grew, he became ever more curious about his destiny. So one day he visited Xu Shao, a man known for spotting hidden potential and talent. At first sight, Xu hated Cao Cao and refused to answer him. But when Cao Cao pressed the matter, Xu answered. You would be a capable minister in peaceful times, and an unscrupulous hero in chaotic times. Cao Cao would play both of these roles and more. As a young man, he was made district captain of Luoyang, the imperial capital, and was quickly promoted to a county governor. This wasn't so due to his talent, but his ruthlessness. As captain, Cao Cao ordered that all who broke the city's curfew laws be flogged, regardless of their status. Then one day, his men flogged the wrong guy, the uncle of an influential court official. But even Cao Cao's superiors were afraid to irk him, so they got rid of him by promoting him to a position far away from the imperial city. His governorship lasted just a year before he had to leave the post because of family connections with the disgraced Empress Song. And around the year 180, he returned to the royal court, but with much less presence than before. Chapter Two. 
the Yellow Turban Rebellion. In the year 184, a peasant revolt broke out across eastern China. In Chinese, this was called Huangjing Zhiluan, which translates to Yellow Turban Uprising. During this time, the imperial city made Cao Cao captain of the cavalry. His mission? Snuff out the rebels and suppress their influence in Yingchuan. The warlord took to his new role well. The rebels were handled and Cao Cao was promoted once more, this time to Chancellor. Chancellor Cao Cao was sent further east to Jinan to annihilate the Yellow Turban Rebellion there. His infamous ruthlessness came to the fore during this time. It is said that he ruled Jinan with an iron fist and enforced his imperial mandate with vigor. His soldiers hounded so-called unorthodox cults, destroyed shrines, and promoted the state religion to Confucianism. But this was to be their undoing. Cao Cao's hard enforcement sparked outrage among influential local families, and fearing for his and his family's safety, he resigned from the role in 187, citing health reasons. But this wasn't the last time Cao Cao and the Yellow Turban rebels would cross paths. Throughout the 190s, the warlord would encounter remnant forces across China. In the spring of 192, it is said that he took their best soldiers and formed an elite fighting force that he titled Qingzhou Bing, the Qingzhou Army. However, by the second century, the once fiery Yellow Turban Rebellion had pittered out and a new threat rose. Chapter 3 The Campaign Against Dong Zhuo it is the year 189, and the emperor has perished. His death has created a power vacuum. Fighting breaks out between the different factions of the royal court. The veteran general, Dong Zhuo, is called in. He quickly eliminates all opposition to the throne. But he has his own plans and enthrones a puppet emperor in the form of a child, a boy named Xian. In the fictional Three Kingdoms story, Cao Cao tries to assassinate Dong shortly after this. During their meeting, Dong turns his back on Cao Cao. He draws his sword, but Dong sees this in a mirror and turns instantly. Cao Cao then pretends the sword is a gift. Not long after, the legendary warrior Lü Bu arrives with a gift horse Dong had instructed him to pick for their guest. Cao Cao takes the animal for a test ride and escapes. But he's a wanted man, and despite his lightning-fast pace, the law soon catches up with him. A county prefect named Cheng Gong tracks Cao Cao down and imprisons him. Yet the two soon become unlikely brothers-in-arms. Chen is moved by Cao Cao following a lengthy conversation, so releases him and joins his quest. Next, the two travel far and wide until they arrive at the home of Cao Cao's friend. Du Bo She welcomed Cao Cao and Chen into his house. They were his guests, but he had to leave and run some errands. While he was alone with Liu's servants and family, Cao Cao became paranoid after he heard knives being sharpened and talk of killing something. He thought they were out to get him. With Chen's help, he slaughtered every single person in the house. No one was left alive. They later discovered that the servants were only planning on killing a pig and not them. Knowing Liu would want revenge, Cao Cao and Chen saddled up and were about to flee just as Liu returned. Cao Cao spoke to him, telling him to look out from behind. And when Liu turned his back, Cao Cao killed his friend on the spot. Chen was shocked. Just now, you made a genuine mistake when you killed those people. But what about now? If he goes home and sees his family members all dead, do you think he will let us off? If he brings soldiers to pursue us, we will be in deep trouble. It is a grave sin to kill someone with the intention of doing so. I'd rather do wrong to the world than allow the world to do wrong to me. Chen left not long after. From Cao Cao's attempted assassination of Dong Zhuo until now has been from the Three Kingdoms story. Now we return to the history. To rid the world of Dong Zhuo, Cao Cao aligned himself with other warlords. Together they pushed back his large army and took back Luoyang, the imperial capital. The battle was hard fought, however, despite their victory. Dong Zhuo had fled with the emperor. But soon his forces fell apart, and he wound up being gutted by his former general, Lü Bu. Chapter 4 The Child Emperor Following Dong Zhuo's demise, the land fell into a bloody civil war, and in the year 193, Cao Cao's father, Cao Song, was killed by Shizhou forces. The grieving son then sought and wrought bloody vengeance in Shuzhou, massacring thousands. 
but that left Cao Cao's dominion unguarded and created the opportunity for Lü Bu and some disgruntled Cao Cao forces to launch an insurrection. Over the next few years, Cao Cao grappled with Lü Bu and fought many battles against the legendary warrior. But despite all of his might, Lü Bu and his forces would soon grow weary. The legend soon surrendered to Cao Cao and he was later executed in 199. Cao Cao had not only outstrategized him, he had squashed him, but this was not the warlord's greatest victory of his era. Years earlier, via intelligent political maneuvering, Cao Cao convinced the emperor to relocate the imperial capital from Luoyang to a stronghold in Shu. There, the young emperor was under Cao Cao's protection and control. The Battle of Guandu Guan Du Zhizhan Cao Cao and his childhood friend Yuan Shao were to fight in the Battle of Guandu in 200 AD. Yuan commanded a combined infantry and cavalry of over 100,000 men. This would not be an easy fight. Both served Emperor Xian, but Yuan thought Cao Cao was powerful and posed a threat. Cao Cao was outnumbered. At most, his forces numbered 60,000. Nonetheless, the warlord made the first move and began attacking Yuan in skirmishes. This caused Yuan's forces to be spread thin as Cao Cao only sent small groups of men to attack. Yuan was aided by another warlord, Liu Bei, in his battle. Despite this, the fighting lasted several weeks and began to exhaust their forces. This was because Cao Cao targeted Yuan's supplies and set them ablaze. And when the winter came, the lack of food combined with the cold left Yuan's forces hungry, tired, and confused. Sensing victory, Cao Cao ordered an all-out attack. His forces routed the tired soldiers of Liu Bei and Yuan Shao. The two fled and Cao Cao was victorious. In the years that followed, he solidified his power and conquered most of northern China. Yuan, meanwhile, died not long after his defeat and his forces faded over time. The Battle of Red Cliff Cao Cao was driven by ambition. He yearned for a peaceful and unified China and would stop at nothing to achieve it. But this, Mythstorians, was to be his downfall. Fresh from conquering the north, Cao Cao turned his attention southwards. Cao Cao initially experienced success in his southern campaign following the surrender of Governor Liu Tong and Jing province. The warlord boasted to have a force of nearly 800,000 men, and he threatened to crush the south if they did not surrender. The threat worried Sun Quan, leader of the southern kingdom of Wu. Could the nearly million-strong Cao Cao wipe them out? Or was it a bluff, as his strategist Zhou Yu thought? Zhou believed Cao Cao's forces to be actually much less than what the warlord claimed. He thought them to number closer to 200,000. So Zhou urged Sun to ally with Liu Bei's forces and to take up arms against Cao Cao. Separately, Cao Cao could annihilate them, but together they made a formidable force. And so, the legendary Battle of Red Cliff began in 208 or 209. Cao Cao's men had marched long and hard for hundreds of miles across the land. However, when the time came to draw steel, many were unfit to fight. The journey had left them sick and tired. Another element that didn't go in Cao Cao's favor this time was the water. He had a navy, but with few or no natural sailors. Many of the men on these boats had no sea legs and as a result got seasick easily. So, Cao Cao had the ships chained together to stop the rocking. Seeing this, Sun Quan's general, Huang Gai, sensed an opportunity to strike a decisive blow. He then sent a letter to Cao Cao, in which he said he and his men would surrender and defect. Next, Huang directed a group of surrendering ships towards Cao Cao's forces. However, as the ships got closer, the supposed defectors began to set them ablaze. Their surrender, Mystorians, was a trick. Huang's forces abandoned their flaming vessels before they collided with Cao Cao's chained ships. And with nowhere to escape, many of Cao Cao's forces drowned or died in the fire. Next, the allied forces charged the enemy and, seeing that his army was in tatters, Cao Cao ordered a retreat. Liu Bei and Sun Quan had banished the forces of the devil. The long march home was fraught with peril for Cao Cao and his men. The weather was against them, enemies pursued them, but by some miracle, they made it. In the fictional Three Kingdoms story, Cao Cao flees and is confronted by the Chinese war god and sworn brother of Liu Bei, Guan Yu, while passing through the Huarong Trail. 
The war god wants to eliminate his foe once and for all. However, he cannot. His conscience won't let him. One looked at Cao Cao's wounded men, and Guan Yu felt only pity, so he let Cao Cao pass. The Battle of Red Cliff was a turning point in the Three Kingdoms era, and following the defeat, Cao Cao would turn his attentions back to the north, where he would spend the remainder of his years. The Emperor of Wei, Wei Taizu, Wu Huangdi. Around 213, Cao Cao was named the Duke of Wei, or Wei Gong in Chinese, and given a fiefdom of ten places to rule. His land was known as Wei, and three years later he was given another title, the King of Wei, or Wei Wang in Chinese. Cao Cao never sought to usurp the emperor, and that was something he held true to throughout his life. He died in the year 220, and his last instructions were that he be buried in a tomb without any treasures. Cao Cao ordered his men to stay at their posts during his funeral because, as he said, the country is still unstable. After he died, his eldest son Cao Pi succeeded Cao Cao, and while his father had no desire for the throne, his son did. He made the emperor abdicate and was enthroned himself. And to honor his dead father, Cao Pi granted him the title Wei Taizu Wu Huangdi, Grand Ancestor Emperor Wu of Wei. Guan Yu, Guan Yunchang, Guan Gong. He is a man of many names, but whatever title this legend goes by, Guan Yu is one of the greatest legends Asia has ever known. He is the warlord who became a myth, the general who became a deity. The man who became a legend, known for his unbending devotion to justice and undying loyalty to his allies, Guan Yu has been worshipped across the globe for generations. Guan Yu rose to prominence during the Three Kingdoms era of ancient China, a period which ran from 220 to 280 A.D. He was one of the Han Dynasty's five legendary tiger generals. A title afforded to the greatest warlords of the time. Tales of his exploits are romanticized in the novel *The Romance of the Three Kingdoms* by 14th-century Chinese author Luo Guanzhong. Part myth, part history, this epic is one of Chinese literature's four great classic novels. But in modern times, the legend spread even further. Guan Yu can be seen in opera. Film, movies, and perhaps most famously, video games. Many came to know him through the popular Dynasty Warrior series, games based on the Three Kingdoms book. And with the release of Total War: Three Kingdoms just around the corner, even more are set to learn of the legend. In this myth story special edition, we'll take you through this warlord's greatest adventures. His blood. Sweat and tears. You'll learn not only his epic life journey, but also of the brothers he made along the way. All of this and more coming up in Life of Guan Yu. Guan Yu became a general under Liu Bei near the end of the Han Dynasty and contributed enormously toward the Liu Bei-ruled kingdom of Shu Han, one of the era's three warring states. But before all that, he was someone else entirely. Young Guan Yu. Details of his early days are scant. What we do know is that Guan Yu was first called Changshen. He was said to be born around 160 A.D. in what is now Shangxi, China. Young Guan Yu was obsessed with a book even older than he, the Zuo Chuan. This historical tome detailed China's ancient history, and Guan Yu had memorized it word for word. Legend has it he could recite any and all of it on demand. After he left home, Guan Yu went on the road. Destiny was calling, and during the Yellow Turban Rebellion, Guan Yu answered. It was here he saddled up with his once and future brothers Liu Bei and Zhang Fei. The fictional Romance of the Three Kingdoms story tells that although the trio were unrelated by blood, they soon became family. 
The Oath of the Peach Garden. The Three Kingdoms story tells us that Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei held a brotherly ritual during the 180s. They swore to protect the Han Dynasty from the Yellow Turban Rebellion. The story goes that they made the oath in a peach garden and became bound by loyalty and brotherhood to one another. This bond tied each to the other in the novel. Despite being fictional, the oath of the peach garden has become an iconic fable of fraternal loyalty. And one way or another, Guan Yu's loyalty was tested when he had to serve Liu Bei's rival, the warlord Cao Cao. Guan Yu and Cao Cao. Cao Cao's army routed Liu Bei's forces when they took back Shu province from him in 200 A.D. Guan Yu was captured and was made to serve under him. Nevertheless, Cao Cao admired his rival and gave him the rank of general. Guan Yu accepted his new post among the warlord's ranks, but remained loyal to Liu Bei throughout his service. Guan Yu was treated very well, and the legendary warrior knew this. So prior to leaving, Guan Yu returned the kindness by slaying an enemy general during the Battle of Boma in Cao Cao's name. Next, Guan Yu sealed all the presents he had received from Cao Cao and wrote his captor a letter bidding him farewell. Cao Cao admired Guan Yu's fealty to his lord and ordered his men not to give chase. Over the next twenty years, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, under the command of Liu Bei, took control of Southwest China under the banner of Shu Han. And what about that beard, right? Guan Yu's legendary facial hair is symbolic of the character. Traditionally, he is shown as a red-faced warrior. The color is thought to come from renditions of Guan Yu in Chinese opera, where it represents courage and loyalty. He's also shown to be drabbed from head to toe in green robes, along with his trademark weapon. And how he got that is a tale in of itself. The Green Dragon Crescent Blade. The Green Dragon Crescent Blade is a traditional Chinese guan dao. This resembles a lengthy spear, with one exception: the massive sword-like blade at its top. It is also called the Frost Fair Blade, a title said to come from winter battles when it was consistently coated in blood. The idea being that the cold froze the blood and made another layer of ice around the blade. It's unknown if Guan Yu actually wielded such a weapon, but according to the Three Kingdoms story, the weapon was crafted by a blacksmith. And paid for by a merchant who believed in his and his brother's cause. Another legend claims that Guan Yu himself fashioned it himself after his brotherly oath. Other tales say that when the blacksmith was creating the sword, a green dragon flew by. The beast got sliced up, and its body parts were later used to craft the weapon. But in reality, Guan Dao blades weren't used in China until centuries after Guan Yu's death. In addition, the weapon is very heavy, often weighing 18 kilograms, and is difficult to handle. But according to the Three Kingdoms, Guan Yu held it in one hand. Mythical Guan Yu is indeed mighty. Legend has it that the warlord was hit by an arrow laden with poison once. The tip struck at the bone, and the poison went deep. Guan Yu called in his healer, and the news wasn't good. The healer cut deep and scraped the poison from his bones. But that didn't stop Guan Yu from having some fun. His men joined him for a feast, and he drank and laughed as if nothing had happened. Mighty indeed, but invincible he was not. Guan Yu's death. Death caught up to Guan Yu around 220 A.D. when he was captured by a Wu Dynasty forces general named Lü Meng. He worked for the warlord Sun Quan and took control over a city Guan Yu ruled. Lü Meng told his troops to treat the populace well after Guan Yu's men had given up the fight and fled the field. Not long after, Guan Yu was executed and his head was said to have been sent to Cao Cao. It is said that the warlord gave his old friend a funeral with full rites. Guan Yu may have been gone, but it was in death his legacy found new life. After his death, 
Guan Yu became legendary and mythical, so much so that some consider him a saint of war. In the time that followed the Three Kingdoms period, Guan Yu became a figure of worship and to this day remains so. In Chinese Buddhism, Guan Gong was said to act as the protector of the Dharma Bodhisattva. He also holds special places in traditional Chinese religion, as well as in Taoism and Confucianism. Temples and statues dedicated to Guan Yu can be found across Asia and elsewhere. He's considered a defender of the weak, but also as a god of wealth and is worshipped by businessmen. He is also believed to be a protector of companies from fraud and ward off other evils. Could not only businessmen, politicians, military officials, police officers, and even gangsters such as the triads all look to him for protection. This all perhaps is best seen in another title bestowed upon him long after he was gone. This was Ren Yong Wei Xian, Hu Guo Bao Ming, Jing Chen Sui Jing, Yi Zan Xuan De, Zhong Yi Shen Wu, Guan Sheng Da Di. This 24 character title translates to Guan, the Holy Great Deity, God of War Manifesting Benevolence, Bravery and Prestige, Protector of the Country and Defender of the People, Proud and Honest Supporter of Peace and Reconciliation, Promoter of Morality, Loyalty, and righteousness. Guan Yu is revered. Thank you, Mythstorian, for watching, and please like, share, subscribe, and ring those mighty bells of notification so you never miss a Myth Stories video. We know all YouTubers say this, but it really helps the channel. But as always, this isn't goodbye. This is just until the next mythical video.